Let me dive right in and say, first of all, Netflix isn't a single product. It really is hundreds of millions of products because each user or member or profile gets their own Netflix experience that's tailored and shaped to them in order to optimize their engagement, their retention at the end of the month so that they want to renew. And so if you look at any one person's Netflix homepage, it won't look like your Netflix homepage. And that's because we're really trying to personalize with machine learning every aspect of it in order to get folks to continue to stream and watch and be engaged and then to renew at the end of the month. And so if you look at what's happening out of the thousands and thousands of movies and TV shows, we have to figure out for you what are the top 20, 30 TV shows and movies that really you'd be interested in. So we have to rank everything and say here are the top, let's say a few dozen that really are the ones you're going to be interested in watching. We personalize the page layout. So where do you want to put those top titles for you? Do you want to kind of organize them into rows with different, let's say, groupings? Do you want to have them kind of scattered about? Um, we also think, do things like personalize the promotion of new stuff that's just launched. So what should we show you that just got added to the service as a billboard or a trailer way up top on, on the top of your page? And today I'll be talking a lot about personalized image selection and artwork selection. But there's also machine learning in things like our search engine, how we message people because we want to tell them about shows that just got released. We can send you a text or a push notification or an email saying, hey, check out this new show for you. We think you'd be really interested in it because you watch something else. And I'll keep going into some of these other examples. Um, but first let me just remind folks one of the first things that Netflix really pioneered in 2006 was this thing called the Netflix Challenge. And that was really looking at how do we do collaborative ranking so that we can all help each other figure out what are the top movies that we should be paying attention to out of thousands or tens of thousands of options. So if you look back 12 years ago now, um, there was this really interesting data set that came out of Netflix which was a big matrix of many, many movies and many, many users and then the star ratings of those movies for those, uh, and for those users. And so that one user might have watched, let's say, Stranger Things and Zootopia and so she's given two stars and three stars. So you've got this matrix which is actually much bigger than three by three and the challenge was to guess the stars for some hidden entries in this matrix. Um, we've moved away from stars because it turns out what really matters is the plays people really are engaging in and not so much the star rating. And because stars are very aspirational. People tend to give, you know, five stars to let's say movies like Citizen Kane because it's historic and well known but no one really wants to watch Citizen Kane. Um, so <laughs> it doesn't get that many plays but it gets a lot of five stars. So it turns out just looking at what people play is a lot more informative. And you can imagine for every user you can have this long binary vector which we call kind of their play history which is out of all the movies put a one on the on movies and TV shows they've watched and put a zero on the ones they haven't. And that represents that user's let's say view history. Um, so the classic approach in 2006 which really popped up and was really very relevant for this challenge was this thing called linear matrix factorization. So you take that ratings matrix R and you figure out how to rewrite it as a product of two skinny matrices U and M. So you know U and M might be kind of four by a million and M might be you know four by a hundred thousand. You take the product of those two things and you make this giant matrix which is a million by a hundred thousand. So if you figure out how to rewrite R approximately as U times M, that gives you an idea of how to fill in the missing entries of R. Uh, so we moved away from linear factorization because it turns out you want nonlinear, let's say, machine learning power to really help drive improvements here. And you can imagine having the view history being reconstructed through a neural network. So rather than reconstruct your view history as a product of two skinny matrices, you can say let me think of a neural network which takes my view history X on the left hand side and then multiplies it by some matrix, squashes it through some sigmoids, multiplies by another matrix, squashes it down and you keep going through these nonlinearities and then you get the smaller version of your viewing history called Z which is kind of the code and that's kind of like one of the pieces of that skinny matrix like instead of having a, a four by a million skinny matrix here you can have like a four dimensional code it's a little more than four but you get the idea. And then you can grow that code back into an approximate view history. And that approximate view history is going to have some 
values in your past zeros, which are non-zero, and those tell you what are the movies you'd be likely to be interested in next. Okay, so the zeros will kind of grow into non-zero values, and the bigger they get, the more important that is for your next movie recommendation. So you can reconstruct the X as closely as possible, but you have to shrink it down to a lower dimensionality, just like the skinny matrices shrank down to lower dimensionality. But now we have non-linearities. You can have many of these kind of slow dimensionality reductions. You can also, instead of trying to reconstruct the user's view history perfectly, say put a distribution like a Gaussian distribution around the view history and say, okay, it's roughly around here and with this kind of uncertainty, you know, so a Gaussian bell curve with error bars. Turns out that's a little bit better because, you know, your view history is kind of a reconstruction of, it's kind of our best guess of where you're going to go in the future given what you've watched in the past, but there's uncertainty around where you're going to go in the future, so you, c you really should put a full Gaussian distribution to capture that uncertainty. This was a technique that was called a variational autoencoder. It was proposed by uh, Max Kingma, uh, Max Welling and Deidre Kingma in 2014. And it does strictly better than regular autoencoders and kind of traditional neural networks. And we further improved beyond that by saying let's go away from the Gaussian uncertainty and let's put a multinomial uncertainty. Because the Gaussian doesn't really make sense. If you think about it, Gaussians are probabilities that go negative it's impossible to have kind of a negative movie preference. And so we replaced the Gaussian at the very end with a multinomial distribution and that was published uh, a few months ago with some of my uh, collaborators and that nicely gives you better predictions that also turns out to sum to one across the entire catalog. So then you get kind of a distribution of what's the probability you're going to play this next, that next and the whole thing has to sum to one because you can't have more than 100% probability across all the movies. Um, just a quick highlight of some of the results. If you try this on standardized data sets, it does a lot better. So here's the million, uh, movie lens 20 million data set and the Netflix data set. And it turns out this multino multinomial variational autoencoder is beating kind of the non, let's say, multinomial one. And it's beating the, uh, the classical autoencoder and it's beating weighted matrix factorization which is that mm, classical technique I showed you from 12 years ago. And so those are the linear techniques so we're moving into a nonlinear world and a probabilistic nonlinear world. That's kind of the better way to capture how to do ranking. Okay so then here's another quick vignette before we jump into the artwork personalization. So one issue is as we're learning off of kind of what people have watched in order to do better recommendation. We also discovered some interesting uh, extensions into causal machine learning and that's because most of machine learning out there is what I just showed you, kind of predict what the person's going to do next. But the reality is when you intervene things kind of get really strange. And here's an example, um, I'll talk about it in a second. But it turns out for most machine learning we don't learn just to learn or just to make a prediction we learn in order to make an action in the real world. We learn models that tell us what to do next. The problem is when you act on those models, you change the source of the data that was used to collect initially the data that trained your models. And so it turns out you actually have to start thinking about things like causality. This is helping us motivate kind of the next stage. But here's a really interesting toy problem just to get us to think about causality. Um, this is the price of airline tickets over time and for let's say one, one airline and the number of flights being reserved over time. And so you can see these kind of spikes in demand at let's say the holidays in 2015, the holidays in 2016, the holidays in 2017 and you can see the prices as well going up during those times, right? Everyone knows that traveling for the holidays is you know when everyone wants to see family and prices are usually a little steeper than when you go during a quiet period. So if you plotted the price and the demand or the number of tickets being sold as you know a little two by two, two uh, sorry a, a, a little kind of correlation plot like this you'd see there's a strong correlation with number of flights being sold and the price going up, right? So you can't use this machine learning model now that was trained on the past data and say, oh great, 
if I increase price, demand goes up and people buy more of my tickets, right? Even though that's what the data is telling you, we know that's not how the world works. And this correlation does not imply causation. So this is one of these aha things that you quickly realize when you start dealing with machine learning for the real world. And the reason is because there's something called a hidden confounder. It's not that price alone is determining the demand. There's another hidden confounder, C, which is, for example, holidays. Or there's a conference in town. Everybody wants to travel to that conference or a couple of co-located conferences. And so most of machine learning is trying to learn kind of an input to output behavior. X is an input. And Y is some target output. We learn these great functions that go from X to Y called F of X. The problem with that is we assume when you learn F of X equals Y, you assume that X completely controls Y. And there's nothing else that's affecting this kind of world you're studying, right? It's not just that price is what determines demand. There's another hidden variable, C, which actually determines both. C determines kind of your appetite for paying more because if it's the holidays, you really have to see family, you will travel no matter what. And so it can actually change your price sensitivity. It'll also increase demand because more people have that time off and need to travel then. So C is actually a hidden confounder which is messing up the analysis. And if you're not careful, you will learn, if you just do traditional machine learning, silly relationships and correlations in the data that cannot be acted upon. You know, if you see people walking in the street with umbrellas when it's raining, a machine learning model might say, oh, you want it to stop raining? Tell everyone to keep their umbrella at home. And so it turns out we discovered this the hard way when we said let's look at how we do personalized mes messaging and send kind of emails or push notifications or pop-up notifications to our members. We basically studied, let's say, how X, let's say the messaging, number of messages, when and what types of messages affect the watching of a member. So if you watch if you watch more after messages are sent to you, that means we should send you more messages, right? It seems to be driving your viewing. But it turns out the same issue kind of affected us. And when we just learned kind of the relationship between messaging and how much people watched, that f of x equals y relationship was kind of silly. And it's because there's hidden confounders. And the main hidden confounder is people watch more Netflix when they also open up their emails about Netflix and check their pop-up notifications. And it's just because people are busy from nine to five working, then they're done with work, that's when they check kind of their pop-up notifications and their emails from us. And that also happens to be when they're also available and able to watch and, you know, get a TV show or movie in. And so this correlation with the hidden confounder is really what's messing up that relationship. And we studied um, this relationship from between X and Y and realized it wasn't really capturing what we wanted and that's because there was a hidden confounder which is, you know, the time of day and other things we can't really measure. So the way we fixed this is we said let's add some little randomization Z. This little source of randomization is basically think of it as a coin flip which says every now and then you were going to send a message, don't send it. Or you were going to send one message, send it, or if, you know, coin flip, you were going to send a message, actually send two messages. So something that randomizes how you do your messaging and that breaks the correlation, right? And so then we do this two-stage learning. We learn a function which says from this Z randomization, predict X, which is the messaging, and then using the reconstructed X, learn another function G to predict Y. And it turns out now if you do this two stages of learning, you first learn F, then you learn G, that G will actually capture the true causal relationships because of these hidden confounders. And so it turns out this was an idea that goes way back. Um, it was used to help prove that cigarettes cause cancer and not that cancer causes more smoking of cigarettes or predisposition to cancer. Um, and Z was that this taxes that were applied on, on cigarette sales by different states. That was kind of a pseudo random thing happening. Some states were taxing cigarettes, some states weren't. That source of randomization then gets you the actual causal relationship. Um, so 
Long story short, here's an example where we actually studied how much email push or in-app notifications help you watch more. On top is if you just learned using ordinary kind of least squares, a model that predicts watching minutes from kind of number of emails, pushes, and in-app notifications. And that model told us really strange stuff when we didn't do this kind of causal version. It told us if you send emails, you actually decrease viewing by a little bit. If you send push notifications, you decrease viewing by a lot. And if you send in-app notifications, you increase viewing by a good amount. And that's because it was not the causal model. It was just learning f of x equals y. And, you know, of course, your business partners who are actually going to look at this say, this is completely nonsense. How can sending someone a push notification make them watch a whole lot less? But it turns out if you do the two-stage version, then you get the correct coefficients and you figure out that, okay, emails help people watch a little bit. Push notifications get a huge increase in viewing and then in-app notifications get a tiny blip upwards in viewing. But you don't get this nonsensical decrease in viewing when you message someone, which you would have learned if you don't understand causality, which is what 99% of machine learning out there does. It's non-causal machine learning, just correlational. Even if you have a deep neural network, it's really chasing after your correlations rather than causations. Okay, so let me now talk about um, the image personalization effort. And we talked about kind of how to personalize and rank and then how to be kind of mindful of causality when you intervene. And then another one is you have to actually explain why you're intervening to the users. Why are you showing me this? Machine learning is great at making predictions. You can be more causal with your predictions. But the user still needs to understand why this is kind of what the machine learning system wants you to do. So this is what the home page looked like before we started personalizing images. It just doesn't, the algorithms don't care how you're going to present these different movies. It just says, oh, put Stranger Things in the top right billboard and put Bright in the second position of the first row and then et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't really know how these movies and TV shows are going to be portrayed. And so the question is, which artwork should we show for different movies? And using machine learning, it was kind of interesting to say, let's change the answer for every single user. Maybe some users really like that top left picture because it's got this kind of spookiness and, you know, scary forest looking thing and it tells you, oh, there's some, some kind of scary aspect. Maybe some other users will like that middle picture in the bottom because it shows, you know, there's some kind of perhaps a relationship going on with two characters and they're kind of teenagers, high school kids and that's interesting for some users who really want a story about someone they can relate to. And so it, we thought let's use machine learning to personalize that decision. And at first we tried to take the classical approach, again, standard batch machine learning, correlational machine learning, um, where we'd collect a bunch of data and then out of all the possible models in kind of our machine learning library, try to find the one that fits the data the best. This is kind of the classical machine learning point of view, right? You sit back, you collect months and months and months of worth of data, then you have a giant grab bag of models and different parameters for those models and you say this is the one light bulb model that fits it best. And you try to do this efficiently with computational speed and statistical guarantees but that's the basic machine learning approach called batch machine learning. Turns out there's a very big cost of that approach when you're dealing with kind of real systems in the real world and that is we've got this long process that we're kind of spending months over our massive user database of hundreds of millions of, of different people where we have to collect data on those people, then spend some time learning that model, then tuning it, engineering it, then running this big thing called an A-B test where in experience A, half the users get the classical machine learned, uh, sorry, classical Netflix experience and in, in B, kind of the other half of the users get this new machine learned experience. And then we see which one kind of does better. Is it A or B? And if B is better, then we roll out B to everyone else. The problem with that is it incurs this massive amount of regret because for many, many months you're wasting time collecting tons of data and building these models so they're just, just perfect. And then you're saying, now let's test our just perfect model in, tel in cell B for several months. 
compare it to cell A, and then finally you're like, oh, this is better. And so for all these users and all these months, you've been giving them really a worse experience until you roll it out. That's the classical approach, and we said let's be a little more mindful about this big waste of resource and look at online learning, which is a much more efficient way of minimizing that regret. And so the idea there is let's interleave the learning, machine learning process with the data collection process. Let's interleave kind of learning and action taking with data collection rather than waiting for all the data to be there, then waiting for the best, best model to be figured out and then take action. Interleave the learning, the action and the data collection together. That's called online learning. And the classical approach to this is related to this multi-arm bandits uh, technique where you think of you walk into a casino, there's many slot machines, each one of them pays off with a different probability and you can play one arm at a time as a gambler. You want to figure out which arm or which machine is the, is the best paying one. And so you want to try them out and you're collecting data about the machines but you don't want to sit there on one machine and just try it a thousand times so you're exactly sure that it's not a very good payoff machine and then move on to the next. You want to kind of try the machines and then kind of slowly figure out, oh, this is the lucky one that really pays out a lot and just keep going to it afterwards. And so there's smart algorithms that figure out how to do this optimally and you can apply those. And the basic idea behind a multi-arm bandit is you've got some learner in the environment and you really want to sequence the learning with the action and the rewarding you're going to get. Right? Not just wait for tons of learning before you figure out how to take optimal actions. So the learner chooses an action, tries it in the environment, observes a reward, updates kind of their model and then chooses a better action and it really is trying to maximize cumulative reward or minimize kind of cumulative, or minimize cumulative regret in hindsight. Both of those are equivalent. And so that's kind of the idea versus just collect tons of data and along the way maybe have very few rewards until you're super confident then be super rewarded. Um, you try to blend the two. And then there's a version called the contextual bandit where in addition the environment also tells you a context. So you get information like is the, is it, is a slot machine blinking or is a, is the slot machine um, you know a uh, loud big slot machine or a small slot machine in the corner. So there's additional information about the slot machines called context. But similarly it's the same idea. It's, the algorithms are very similar. But the key difference between standard supervised learning and bandits is again this idea of online learning and taking action and updating your models in a kind of sequential way. But in a bandit, unlike supervised learning where you get input X, you predict an output Y and then you get to see was Y correct, yes or no, um, and you get to see the real Y, the actual label afterwards, right? In supervised learning we get to see the target. In contextual bandits you see an input X, you predict an action to take A and the world only tells you if A was good or bad. It gives you a dollar if you got the right answer, gives you zero dollars if you didn't but it doesn't tell you oh the best action was action 15. When you proposed action 12 that was wrong, should have said action 15. It just tells you no action 12 was wrong. I won't tell you what the right one was. That's kind of another fundamental aspect of contextual bandits that's different from s classical machine learning of X to Y. So in other words, here's an example of how supervised learning, if you say here's a picture, that's the context, and you say okay I'm going to label this as a cat, you're told that's wrong and the correct label is dog. Right? That's the supervised approach. In contextual bandit you say that's a cat, you you're told, no, that's wrong. You have to try again because you can't just say, oh, now I know the label is dog like it was done in the second example here. Now you have to try again. You can have to say fox. And no, that's not fox. Also you get zero reward. Try a seal. So it, it takes a lot more effort when you only get this kind of, you know, reward type signal versus the true label. Um, so here's, sorry, I, didn't do the drop down. Um, so again, there's a cat, you guess dog, it's wrong. Eventually for the next example you know to say dog immediately. But in the contextual bandit example you have to keep trying until you get the uh, 
the correct answer. So it may take you 12 tries on the same input to figure out what the right output is because you're only getting binary answers. Okay, so for the artwork problem, this is how we set it up as a contextual bandit. The context X is that user's view history. What did they like to watch in the past? What country are they in? Things like that. The action is what's the best image to show for that show? So that TV show or that movie. So there may be, in this example, nine different images for Stranger Things. Sometimes, you know, 20 or so images. You show that image for Stranger Things for that user. That's the action you took. All you get to see is the user didn't like it and didn't play. The user doesn't tell you, oh, by the way, if you'd show me the image of those two kind of teenagers, then I would have played it. They don't tell you the actual true label. They just tell you, no, that was bad. So you have to try something else, and then you get the binary reward, and you go, aha, that's, that's the image that worked for them. So you may have to do kind of nine different tries until you get that reward and figure it out. Okay, so what is a good outcome? Um, for us, the reward is when our subscribers at home watch some content, like it, enjoy it. Okay, that's the reward for, for our algorithms. A bad outcome is they don't click, they don't watch, they abandon that session, they try to find something and then they just do something else instead and, and you know, read a book or, or play a game. All right, so, that, so our reward, reward is people watching and you can compute how well you're doing roughly by this thing called the take rate. So if you look at, we have let's say three users and this is what we show them on their page. The, there's a, a female user up top, she gets all these images on her home page. Then there's another couple of users, they get these other images. And we're trying to figure out for altered carbon, how good is this image of altered carbon? See that top left image, it's kind of someone's neck and there's kind of a glowy thing on the back of their neck. So it turns out for that female user, she liked that image and she clicked and watched. Those two other users got served that same image, they didn't click and watch. So we got rewarded once out of three attempts. And so we get a take rate of one third for altered carbon, okay? So we think of it as we made one dollar out of three possible max dollars we could have made in that situation. That's the take rate. So how do we optimize take rate and minimize regret and maximizing maximize cumulative reward, we do this thing called a contextual bandit and the actual specific algorithm, there's a bunch out there, there's UCB, there's Epsilon Greedy, there's Thompson Sampling. Thompson Sampling is a pretty good one. It, it handles kind of non-stationarity in the data so users can kind of change their mind and things can kind of evolve over time. But the basic big picture is instead of looking at all your users and waiting until you have that single best model, with Thompson sampling, try a bunch of models randomly. Different users get different models. And then you slowly eliminate models that seem to be working badly. And you drop them out, you X them out. Then you keep trying and trying and trying and eventually you'll kill off all the bad models until you're left with that best light bulb model. And that's kind of the idea behind Thompson sampling. You start off with a prior distribution which is all models are all pretty much equally good. That's kind of the P of theta, the models. And then you sample from that and then you do with that model some action. You get an, a context X, you compute an action, get a reward, and then you update your data and you update your model's distribution and now you've eliminated some models and favored others and slowly you'll figure out what the winner is. But unlike the old approach where you have to do tons of data collection, tons of modeling and then try things out, here you're doing kind of slow elimination of the bad models. So here's an example of how we figure out what the best image without any context. This is just an unpers uh, unpersonalized solution and a non-contextual bandit. This is just a vanilla bandit where we don't care about the context of what does this user watch and what country are they in. We quickly figure out by doing kind of this Thompson sampling algorithm that the bottom right image is the best one and that's the one that gets the most rewards and we, we try all six randomly, eventually just like being in a casino with six slot machines, we figure out that's the best slot machine with those two actors in it. But then we can also include the context which is the user's view history and say okay, what's the best slot machine for you? What's the best image for you based off of your view history and the country you're in? 
and a few other things, um, but primarily that. Um, no other kind of demographic information, for example. If you watch a lot of romance, like this person here with serendipity, eternal sunshine, and uh, while you are sleeping, the best image for goodwill hunting is this one. That's what the algorithm figures out. Because you like, you know, that's the gateway into this movie. Why should I pay attention to this movie? We figure out you like romance, and here's a romantic thing that happens in this movie, and that's kind of motivation to give it a try. Here's another user downstairs. That's a user who watches a lot of silly comedies. Um, turns out, if you watch a lot of comedies, the algorithm suggests you should watch Goodwill Hunting with a picture of Robin Williams because he's a comedian. Okay, so it does kind of sensible things. And a, a few other things it realizes if you watch a lot of Uma Thurman movies, for Pulp Fiction, show the picture with Uma in it. If you watch a lot of John Travolta movies, for Pulp Fiction, show the picture with John Travolta. Um, so this is kind of automatically inferred from the data without you know, anyone saying, oh, this is how we deterministically figure out this rule. It, it's learned. Um, okay, so how do we evaluate how well this is doing? It turns out there's a great technique called replay, and this allows us to figure out if you built an algorithm like this, figure out how well it will do once you roll it out in the real world. So before you try it out in the real world, you have to prove to the business folks that this is going to help and not hurt. So here's an example where for disenchantment we changed the image and we have six users and half of them got the image with kind of this uh, queen princess with a crown and then the other ones have this kind of multi-character image. And these were kind of random, randomly assigned at the very beginning. Those are the logged actions that happen in the real world. We want to predict now how a new algorithm which will do different things does. So here's a new algorithm and it says for this first user I should have shown them the, the queen picture, for the second user queen and the other two kind of the multi-character and then the last two users should have gone queen and queen. How good is this algorithm given the data we've logged in the past? And we don't have the counterfactual, right? I don't have, for example, for the, that second female user her response to that queen image. I don't know what she would have done. Maybe she would have played it when she didn't play it before. The way we do it is we say, okay, look at when you actually matched what happened in real life. And on those examples, compute your average take rate or your average reward. So forget the data when you don't match, but when you do match what happened in the real kind of real world log data, we realize, oh, okay, I matched half the time with this new algorithm and this algorithm picked correct matches where there were two plays and picked a correct match where there wasn't a play so the take rate for this algorithm would be two thirds. Whereas for, for instance the other random policy might have had a take rate of one third because only these two things got plays for example. Right, so the, the logging policy really got six chances and got it right two out of six. But this new policy from our model only agreed with a logged one half the time, but when it did agree, it was on those winners that actually got plays. So that's how we compute the, this replay take fraction. It turns out this is, this is an unbiased way to evaluate how you're doing before you go out in the real world and try things out. It's easy to compute. The observed rewards are real. Unfortunately, it requires lots of data and it has kind of high variance, if people kind of know what I mean. Um, there are techniques to improve on it. There's a technique called doubly robust uh, offline policy evaluation as opposed to replay, but nevertheless, it gives you a good idea of before you go out and try stuff out in the real world, how well is it going to do? Um, so this is kind of our estimate in take fraction of this contextual banded algorithm and you can see the take fraction of random in green which, where we just don't know anything, we just try images randomly on the users. That gives us a pretty bad take fraction. In the middle is a bandit which doesn't care about your view history, it just figures out what the best image is overall. It doesn't try to personalize it, just says this is the best image if I had to throw away all the other images. And then the contextual bandit is the one that figures out for your use, for your view history, here's your best image. For your view history, here's your best image. For your view history, here's your best image. 
and it does definitely better than non-personalized. And the variety also helps because if you don't have too much variety, there's no point in personalizing. If there's just one image, that's the winner no matter what. Um, so there's about a dozen, sometimes more than that, 20 or so images. If you kind of check with your friends and they're Netflix, you'll say, oh, okay, there may be 12 different images for Orange is the New Black and I'm getting this one, my friends are getting that one. And it sometimes wiggles around and changes the best image for you. It's not always the best image because your view history changes, your X changes over time. You know, you start watching more romance, you're going to get the more romantic images. Um, okay, so how do we do this now with an online performance evaluation? First, if you want to go online, you need to be smart about your engineering and you need to scale. A lot of the stuff offline can be done with kind of simpler approaches where you don't have to worry about you know, latency and things like this. But when you're actually going to serve these images, you're going to get calls from the Netflix UI for, you know, what should I put on the home page? What image should I put in the search and the galleries? All these requests mean about 20 million requests per second at peak. So if you want to test this thing in the real world, it better be able to scale to that number of requests. And also the UI code written is assuming image lookup is super fast. So it turns out if you want to plug in a machine learning model into this kind of super fast process, it might slow things down and might not be reliable because, you know, we ne really need to test this out without really rewriting the UI code or slowing down the UI code. So there's two strategies. You can try live compute where you compute the best image for each user live or you can do online pre-compute where you pre-compute for every user not waiting for the request but pre-compute before they even open their browser what the best images are for each title for them. This requires more com computation on the right and more caching. Um, on the right hand side. On the left hand side, it gives you the freshest possible data because you only figure out for this person what their image is right now, which means if they just watch a show, you can maybe figure out, oh, they just watched a romantic show, here's the more romantic image. This is super fresh on the left hand side, but it really requires strict SLA and very fast turnaround and me it ma makes you really use only simple algorithms. Whereas if you do online pre compute, you can run more complicated machine learning models. The problem is you have to compute for every user ahead of time their images and store them and cache them. So it's making you kind of do more computation and sometimes you don't need that actual user's image because they're not going to log in that day. Um, real quick, here's the architecture, but the basic summary is we need to do this in pre compute. And so for, we run the bandit for each title and each profile. We choose the best personalized image for that pair. We store that best personalized image pair for that user in EV cache and then we can do a quick lookup off of EV cache at request time. So again, we're not doing live computation of the images at request. That's the key. We also have to do a lot of logging ahead of time. We in pre-compute we log what the image was that was selected for this particular user and movie pair. We, we store the probability of that image being selected. Remember these, these are bandits. You have to log the probabilities of them having taken that action. We have to log the candidate pool because in some countries some images aren't available for various reasons, um, legal and so on. And we also snapshot your features, the context of the user at that time. So all that has to happen as well. There's a lot of logging happening behind the hood. And then we have to join the rewards with the features and this is done all kind of with DeLorean. We train the model using Spark and this is gets then published to production. And at the end we have now a scalable system. We also have to monitor it. Um, we track the quality of the model online all the time, making sure none of these jobs are failing. We compare kind of offline metrics to online metrics and we keep a little bit of the traffic also with randomized images just to do sanity checks. And then finally we also have a graceful degradation scheme. So it's great to do super sophisticated machine learning and personalized images but sometimes more complicated systems fail more often. So it's good to have a simpler backup system for when the, the complicated thing fails. And then even, so you find the best image in an unpersonalized way and show that if you don't have the best personalized winner and go to a default image if you really don't know what to show because both systems failed. So we have kind of a 
hierarchy of machine learning systems that are simpler and simpler and simpler in case the complicated ones fail. There's always some backup image. Users don't like it when you show a black icon for, for a movie with a number on it. Um, okay, so we tested this as an A-B test. It worked. It improved, let's say, the engagement of the users and it was rolled out to 130 million uh, members. And it turns out to help the most for lesser known titles. Everyone knows Pulp Fiction, so you don't really need to know, oh, the John Travolta is in Pulp Fiction, now I'll watch it. But something new that's not well known, it's important to kind of figure out for that new title, what is the connection with this user so that they'll actually give it a try. A try. Like the why behind the machine learning. Oh, you're recommending me this title? Why? Oh, because it has a cool car chase scene and that's what the picture is telling me and I like action and car chases. Um, here's a video. Okay, so very quick, uh, uh, what's next? I mean, if it works well on images, we should try to change every aspect of the UI and make it all personalized. So we're looking at ways of changing how we present the rows, the rankings, the, the title of the row, the evidence, like, oh, this won an Emmy or not. So should we personalize what we tell you about it? The synopsis, should I write long text or do you only want short text versus just changing the images? The metadata, you know, all of that can also be personalized. The trailer choice can also be personalized. And finally, we're also looking at ways of picking the artwork automatically rather than having people doing kind of a curated artwork kind of palette and giving us the 20 images for a show. Can we just kind of scan the footage of the show and automatically find potential good artwork and then do this kind of personalization engine on top of that? Um, so, great, I'll wrap up here. Uh, we're hiring. If you're interested, take a look at research.netflix.com. Thank you very much. Um, in one of your earlier slides, you mentioned multi-node denoising. Can you talk a bit about what, how you detect noises, what you do to discard them, and does that help or improve your uh, selections? Um, so the denoising, good question. It's, so we're, when we're saying multinomial denoising, we're not actually denoising it in the classical way. We're just saying that that's our model of the noise and the uncertainty. And it basically changes your neural net's loss function and it also gives you an output which is really a kind of a sum to one probability. So that's all we really did. We changed the, the last layer of a neural net so it gives you a slightly different output than what a, what a typical neural net gives you which is just a bunch of numbers between, you know, minus infinity and plus infinity. It now gives out a distribution which sums to one across the entire catalog of movies and TV shows. So if a user starts watching a movie and then stops watching it because they didn't like it, so what is the, what will the algorithm do about this? Because if you give it like an image they like, they're going to start and then regret having started it. So you would learn, if you want them, if you say, oh, it's bad if they do that, then you give them the worst possible image so they don't even start, right? So that's a good point. Um, we do have better ways of evaluating if somebody really got their value from starting that movie and TV show. So if you start a TV show and you only watch, you know, for a few seconds and cancel, we don't count that as a reward. So the reward is actually a little more subtle than just clicking. It's not click based reward. It's really looking at how much you watch as well. But that's kind of really in the weeds and the details. But yeah, it's a good point. Uh, you, you want to enough of the show being watched for it to be considered a, a reward. Think of it that way. Uh, how do you address the uh, issues that there are multiple users under the same account. So for example, a family or? So for multiple users on the same account, sometimes you can switch profiles and that tells you if you're in, with, in one profile you're watching romance and in another profile you're watching cartoons, then we personalize for the profile. But if it's many people sharing a profile, then we just treat it as a user who has a 
you know, a diverse viewing. We, we don't try to tease apart who is really behind the screen. So when doing playback to evaluate your uh, newly learned policy, how, why doesn't the take rate of the, the old take rate, the old success rate of the images that you've now changed matter? Uh, so the old take rate does matter. So if the old logging policy had a really bad take rate, then it's harder to get a really great take rate because you have to only agree with it when it was successful. So yeah, you, you basically have this high variance problem where you want to improve as high as possible your take rate, but you also want to coincide very often with the old logging policy. And so there's kind of a trade-off there. Um, yeah. Well, uh, uh, are you leveraging any uh, of uh, One more question, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, are you leveraging any of the recommendation systems that are out there? Because you know, I, I, you're talking about contextual algorithms, right? There, there, there are recommendation systems like Prediction IO, Action ML. Is it home built uh, within Netflix, or uh, you know, are, are you using something that's out there? Leveraging, I mean. Um, so in terms of all the code behind all these algorithms, it's all custom written code. Uh, mm -hmm. and we're not kind of using standard packages. A lot of the stuff, the, you know, the equations are fairly reasonable, but the implementation, because of the scale, we really have to do with our own in-house custom frameworks. Oh, so the con yeah. contextual bandit is kind of like proprietary? So that the code for all of this is built in-house proprietary, yeah. 